بخریم Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Christ Church UCC. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. This morning, let's give a round of applause to our birthdays for the week, and that is Peter Rosedale and Carol McConnell. There's a lot of announcements in your bulletin, so please make sure you read them. And make sure you give your prayer intentions to the ushers before our scripture reading. And as you notice this morning, we have our candle lit, and that is because our church sibling, Judy Hurt, passed away this past week. So we were notified on Friday, and yesterday I shared an email for those of you who received an email that she had passed. The, uh, she will have a celebration of life at some determined time later on, where, is also to be determined. Her family is within that wedding. So just that there will be a celebration of life at a later time. And love. receive that and for all of our church family and those that we know outside of church who are in the hospital or at home with ailments that they may have the care that they need and the support that they need at this moment <clears throat> christ the living stone and cornerstone of our faith is building us into spiritual houses in a holy priesthood let us open ourselves to the master builder. O God of all creation, become for us once again the solid foundation upon which we build our daily lives. We gather before you this first day of the week to align our lives to the strong teaching and life of Jesus Christ, our cornerstone. Receive our praise and thanksgiving as expressions of faith and love. We come to you, O Lord, as people who desire to learn and serve like Christ. We are ready to receive your blessing and direction today. In faith and trust, we pray as we enter into silent prayer. Amen.
If those of you who are notice in the bulletin, we have had an asterisk in certain parts of our church service. And if you notice in the very top, it says for you to rise in spirit or physically. So at this time, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me from your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, lead and guide me for the sake of your name. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me from your unfailing love. You may be seated. Please join me in our prayer of reconciliation. Living God, in times of spiritual homelessness, we long to hear Jesus' assurance that he has prepared a place for us. We yearn to be formed by the master builder into spiritual houses, like living souls. Grant us the courage of Stephen and the confidence of Peter as we strive to be a holy priesthood. In your blessed name we pray, amen. Now take a moment of silence for your silent confession. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and place your faith in Christ. Make your petitions known and the one who is faithful will answer. God is our refuge and our strength. See this in one another as you're past the peace of Christ. I now invite you to stand in body or spirit to share a sign of peace by waving to each other.
us ears hear and listen. The word of the Lord speaks to the living of our lives today. God's word is our fortress and our strength, providing shelter and a foundation for daily living. Let the one who has ears hear and listen. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 7, verse 55 through 60. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him, and the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. When they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Our second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that, the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This honor, then, is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. The stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Please stand and body your spirit for our gospel reading according to John 14, verses 1 through 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my God's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that there where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the parent except through me. If you know me, you will know God also. From now on, you do know God and have seen God. Philip said to him, Lord, show us God and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen God. How can you say, show us God? Do you not believe that I am in God and that God is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the parent who dwells in me does his work. Believe in me that I am in the parent and the parent is in me. But if you do not, then believe because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the parent. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the parent may be glorified in the Son. 
If in my name you ask me anything, I will do it. Do not place a period where God has placed a comma. God is still speaking. You may be seated. I hope those of you who are fully awake would have paid careful attention into our scripture reading, particularly what I just read in the gospel. Now I goofed on one term, but you will notice because we have become open and affirming, and because there is no concrete image of God, we have to refer to God as God or they, them, in general when we speak. Now, does that mean that God cannot be male because that's how you feel? Definitely. Of course. Personally, God to me is male. But as part of being a church community and the teaching, we have to be able to speak to more inclusive God. Because then it allows people to imagine God in whatever image they are comfortable with. Now, can we still refer to God as he, him, his? Definitely. Particularly when we're talking about Jesus and how Jesus talks about his father. We don't have to change that. See, and when I talk about that, I have to go back to when I was in seminary, still very Roman Catholic, and try to unravel some of that theology, had an instructor, professor, reverend doctor, and when we were going through this class, where the class was almost over, and I told her, well, I just don't get it. She's like, well, don't you get it? I'm like, God is he, him. She's like, is God really that? See, Moses didn't talk to a man at the top of the mountain. He spoke to a burning bush. We don't have an image of what God is, a physical image. We have one of Jesus, who is man. But where is one of God? See, and she went on to explain that when I insist as pastor, as preacher, that God is only absolute male, and there's someone sitting in a pew who has been abused in any respect by a male, by a man, I intend to inflict pain on that person because I do not allow that person to see God in an alternate mode. Because maybe because they've been so hurt by males that they want to feel that God is female because otherwise, then why would God allow such pain in their life? And I still had some trouble understanding that. See, and then she explained how she went silent for years after witnessing her mother being murdered in front of her eyes. And the way that she found was to see God inclusively at a young age and to use her voice in singing. And that's how she reclaimed her voice. A few months later, I was teaching vacation Bible study in Bible school. And my nieces hadn't moved yet. They were still back in Texas, but they came to visit, and there were two of the kids that were there. And as they were sitting, I was, you know, teaching about God and this and that, the UCC. And I had that aha moment. If I allow God to be imagined in any image, If they allow, they were allowed to see that, to conclude their own image, that might build a closer, warmer relationship with God. 
And it allowed me to acknowledge that my nieces at that point could imagine God in whatever way they wanted. If they wanted to say that God was female and that made them strong, then who am I to stand in their way? Now that was not part of my sermon. So I just throw that in in case you wondered why I switched from father to parent. And we notice I did goof on one, I didn't change the pronoun, and I just said he, and I was like, oh, okay. Because when we change what we've been used to, the traditional way, it's hard to change, it's hard to move over. And it's hard for me too, I still slip. Am I gonna frown and tell Kyle, God is only God, they there, no. If Kyle says, well, you know, I wish God the Father would, you know, show me a sign. I said, well, Kyle, let's talk about that. No. Now, we'll talk about whatever is bothering him, but I'm not going to change the way that he envisions God. Because that is important. Now, most of you may say, well, I don't see the point. That's okay. You don't have to. But there might be a person or two who is like, huh, okay, I get it. And that's okay too. So, just put that out there as we grow accustomed to that. Again, not going to change who God is to you. We just have to allow people to envision God in whatever image they want to envision God. We know that when things are translated, we lose some of the original content. Like, Ruth knows German. So if she were to speak something in German, it might not quite translate into English or vice versa. In Spanish, sometimes what's three or four words in English is like 10 words in Spanish or vice versa. And then again, one thing in English could mean 10 different things in Spanish. So it's not surprising that in today's gospel, we also lose some of that translation. Sometimes the translation becomes longer. Sometimes it's shorter. But I want to refer to the verse that says, do not let your hearts be troubled. The original sentence really referred to the singular. Do not let your heart be troubled. Before we understand why it matters, so let's recall that last week we also discussed what it means to follow our shepherd. So it's only fitting that we continue some of that today. We heard that when we lose out, We heard that we lose out when we, as individuals and part of our church community, don't act against justice. So if you're witnessing injustice and you say nothing, See, people will read the gospel, read scripture, and like, oh, that's what it says right there. And not to be elitist, but I'm going to sound like that for a moment. I'll own it. Suddenly, everybody becomes a theologian and has a gradual level degree and can tell you specifically what's in the scripture and what it says and what it means. Now, do you have to have a graduate level degree to do that? No, you don't. But when you just read at face value, you're not really doing the work. And so when we look at today's scripture, we have to look at who was the original audience, what was going on at that time, to better understand. 
See, and at that time, this crowd that was barely hearing this for the first time, they had separated from their synagogue. The Johannian was alone and isolated. Imagine the first congregation who decided to become open and affirming. How they may have felt. Well, the first congregation who was certified wise for mental health advocacy, how they felt. Or that first congregation who said, we support immigrants and refugees, and we stand for Or the first congregation who said, we stand for Black Lives Matter. Does that mean that other lives don't matter? No, it does not. And often that's the argument, well, what about us? Well, I will remind you of the story of the image where Jesus is going out to the one sheep that is lost, that is in danger, versus the rest of the is and safe. Jesus is like, oh, well, Linda, I'm sorry. You matter, but find your way back. You're good. I'm going to stay here where everything's nice and safe. No. Jesus is going to go to Linda, knowing that you are safe and sound, and say, hey, Linda, let me show you the way back. Let me make sure you're safe. That is what Black Lives Matter means. It is not to take away from the rest of us. And so when we think about that, this community was feeling isolated, alone, probably afraid, anxious. There's probably a handful of you who were a little anxious when we like voting to become open and affirming and wise. And you're like, well, what does this mean? I still don't quite understand it. And you know what? That's okay. It's a learning process. I'm still learning. And some of you I've shared that sometimes the sermons that I give are not just for you. It's a reminder to me that what I preach, I must practice. So you could say that this also happens in other congregations, when you're feeling alone, isolated. When you move away from the traditional, from the harmful and toxic theology that we know still exists out there. How many times have we not heard a preacher, a pastor, clergy, whatever, a church leader, confront statistically a female and say, well, what did you do to entice the pastor? What were you wearing? And yes, this is 2023 and we still hear it. See, those toxic mentalities, toxic theology still exist. And today's scripture, particularly our gospel, is telling you, don't just do as good as me, do better. How many of you didn't grow up with your parents saying, hey, I want you to succeed in life, not just succeed, but I want you to succeed even more than I did. I know I did. That is my hope and dream for you. See, that is what Jesus is telling us today. Don't do just as good as I have done. Do better. Does it mean that he did a poor job? No. But he knows that we can do better. When our heart, our heart is driven to incorporate more of Jesus' love, we 
Now heart refers to the idea of any church community that operates as one heart, one body. That's why I say church community, church family. That's why when we take a vote, we take the majority. That I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these. Jesus served as a rock then and now. Placed on that cross for us. Our foundation as Christians began as having Jesus as a foundational rock. We can't go wrong when we utilize the love and the call Jesus made for us. When we use our human made foundation, that rock will cave in, crack, and deteriorate quickly. Our foundational rock in Jesus provides us hope and the ability to dream for a more inclusive and affirming community and body. And it's not enough to say that we do it for God. We must live it. Jesus is clear that when we work to make our way to God, our work must be greater than his. We must exhibit the way, the truth, and life for communities who feel disjointed and prohibited access to know there is hope and affirmation. Our work must demonstrate equality, equity, access to food, health care, affordable housing, and continued dignity as fellow children of God. Make it your choice or not, calling yourself a Christian calls upon you to include people. We are not to place any conditions or asterisks upon an inclusive welcome. Imagine if we have a lot more young people in our congregation and they began a movement and say, well, we don't want people at this service time unless they're 55 and younger. Many of you would not be happy. And I already know some of you would be a little louder than the others. And I can assure you that I wouldn't stand for that. Because my goal is to do little to no harm. And I keep reminding you what that means is that sometimes in a early, I may cause harm. Do I do it intentionally? No. And so there was a... I said, I'm sorry, that's not gonna fly. Because when we look at foundation, some of you are part of that foundation for this church community. And without you, some of this wouldn't have worked out. So once again, I remind you, we are not to place any conditions or asterisk or fine print upon an inclusive welcome. Jesus is the way, the truth, and life for us to act as a single heart, with no exceptions. May the word shared today enter your heart, your soul, and your mind, and allow you to embody what Jesus is calling you to live. Amen. who has come in the true man Jesus to reconcile and make you, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust him. He calls us to be his church, to celebrate his presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. Thanks be to God.
Next song is actually in the red hymnal 210. Let us break bread instead of what's in the white. 210. <laughs> As we begin to wrap up our confirmation year, don't forget that on Pentecost Sunday, we will have confirmation for our three youth. Don't be shy. But as part of their continued education, today they will help you serve communion. So when we distribute your communion, they'll come up and help me with that as part of their learning process. See, part of their education, the curriculum for the entire school year has been not just the academic, the theology, but it's also the hands-on experience. The rest of the real life, church life. As we begin communion, I will remind you that there is no RSVP for this table. It does not matter who you are. The Holy One be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to God. Let us give thanks to God in whose image we are made. To the Creator of all, we give thanks and grace. Divine Protector, Defender of Life, your love for this world is everlasting. As oceans burn and species go extinct, our children are made vulnerable at school and our neighbors are denied at our borders. There is so much reason to despair. But you, O oh God, refuse to abandon us to destruction. Christ takes on flesh. In the midst of struggle, you are a glimpse of hope, encounters of freedom, taste of what satisfies when you so much leave empty. In these incarnate moments, we sense the closeness of your kingdom. Holy, holy, holy one, God of justice and love, Heaven and earth are full of your wonder, O Sana among us. You, O God, reorder the world into right relationship. You lift high those made low. You humble the arrogant. You hear the earth groaning upon capitalism and consumption, and your fire burns in the hearts of your prophets. With this hope and assurance, we turn to the witness of Jesus, whose teaching revealed the way to liberation. 
We seek his wisdom. We practice his courage. We remember his radical commitment to love. On the night of his arrest, Jesus shared a meal with his companions. He took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup, blessed it, and shared it, saying, This is the cup. Poured out is a new covenant. In remembrance of the love that saves us, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ was birthed among us. Christ was executed among us. Christ rises again among us. May the Spirit come and set upon the gifts. Make this bread and this cup be for us a holy encounter, reminding us that Christ is with us. The resurrection is a promise granted to us, that the kingdom is always closer than we can imagine. May we be nourished, that we might nourish others. Body of Christ. gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for the meal is ready.
God, we thank you for allowing us to nourish our souls with this community. Amen. <clears throat> God of grace and light, found within and out, where the structures of humanity you cannot be contained, but on occasion choose to dwell in hearts and homes. Glance lightly upon the hearts and homes dear to us, the people and places where we seek blessing. Build up our homes where we, the happy, find play, peace. The sad may find comfort, the hungry may find food, the weary may find rest. Build up the places where we work, where the honest may find reward, the dedicated may find delight. The imaginative may find new horizons. Build up our community where the isolated may find friendship, the marginalized may find welcome, the unloved may find acceptance. Help us this day to be living stones and not dead weights, dreaming dreams and living glorious to the joy and kindliness of a faith that edifies everything that life should be. In the name of our Savior, our cornerstone, we pray this in the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, as we invite you to give, we are better together. When we join in music or mission or ministry or fellowship, we discover that God makes us better, building built upon the another. Like living stones in the house of the Lord, let us join together now as we receive the tithes and offerings you have brought. We have this common faith and common calling to be in ministry together. And as you may recall, looking in your bulletins, there will be a second collection for mission today as well.
May the love of God take away your milestones and place you up high on the rock, that you may see more clearly the calling of God in your life. Into the hands of God, commend your spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen.
I do think it is. You are? As I say, but I, I repeat. <laughs> I am okay. How are you? I, where can I go? Is there an office place around? I just need to go and get those stupid things spiral. You're not possible.